Welcome back to the 51A podcast. Today we are going to explore the Citizenship Amendment Act and the National Register of Citizens in India. The CAA was passed in 2019 and offers expedited citizenship to persecuted non-Muslim minorities from Afghanistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh. This raises raises concerns about religious discrimination and constitutional violations. The NRC aims to identify genuine Indian citizens, but its implementation has caused fear and disenfranchisement amongst vulnerable communities. To unpack these complexities, we are privileged to have with us today Dr. Moseem Alam Bhatt, a lecturer in law at Queen Mary University of London. His research for law, minority rights, and the intersection of law, religion, with politics. He has extensively studied the implications of CAA and NRC on India's legal and social fabric. We look forward to hearing his insights. So with your permission, we'd like to start with the first question. Um, Can you explain the constitutional and other international law principles that underpin citizenship laws in India and how the CAA aligns or conflicts with these principles? So uh, thank you for having me. Um, Citizenship laws are notoriously discretionary. And what I mean by that is that around the world, it's understood that governments or parliaments uh, are free to decide what the rules of allocation or acquiring of citizenship status is. So for instance, in India, the citizenship status is regulated under the 1955 Citizenship Act. And there are different ways in which citizenship is acquired. So it could be acquired by birth or by descent based on what your parents uh, are, whether they are Indian citizens or not. They could also be, uh, citizenship status could also be acquired through registration or naturalization. So naturalization would be a process in which a foreigner comes into India, lives for a certain period of time, and then becomes an Indian citizen if certain legal stipulations are fulfilled. Um, And like most other places in the world, this is not necessarily a restricted power uh, for government or for parliaments. So under the Indian constitution, Article 11 provides what seems to be an unlimited power to parliament to decide who can be an Indian citizen and who need not be. There are some rules, if you look at part two of the constitution, that apply to citizens, but that was at the time of India's independence. So when the constitution was initiated in 1950, it was then that those rules were Uh, brought into place in the constitutional text itself, but that doesn't stop parliament from changing those rules or adding to those rules. But my own feeling is, and what I've argued previously is that just because Article 11 does not say that parliament's power is limited, uh, it doesn't mean that parliament's power is unlimited because under our constitutional scheme, parliament's power is one limited by fundamental rights. So part three of the constitution, so for instance, demands of non-arbitrariness would still apply to parliament's power and would still restrict parliament's power. Another source of limitation has been what I would call constitutional identity. So for example, the rule of law or secularism, these are principles which are so well regarded or so understood to be the very foundation of the Indian constitution that parliament would not just violate those norms, either through constitutional amendments also or even through ordinary laws. So those would be some broad values that parliament has to respect while making uh, while making citizenship laws. Now, second part of your question was, what about Constitution, the Citizenship Amendment Act in 2019. And the major argument, and I have supported that argument against the laws has been that it is both arbitrary under Article 14 of the Constitution, which is a binding fundamental right uh, for Parliament, as well as the fact that it violates some of the most important uh, features of constitutional identity in India, specifically secularism. So I'm happy to sort of elaborate on uh, the legality of Citizenship Amendment Act if you want right now, or uh, I'm happy to answer any other question you have before we come to that. Um, Professor, it would be really great if you could elaborate a little bit more on it, especially the conflict with the minorities as well. Right. So as, as you had sort of perhaps just indicated in your introduction, what the Citizenship Amendment Act does is it provides a faster route to citizenship through naturalization for some populations who have come into India. 
Now, the stipulation is important to understand because there are many conditions that CAA 2019 places. The first is the stipulation that it should be a minority community from Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and Afghanistan. But the word that is used uh, or the sort of the framing of CA 2019 is not they can be any minority. It has to be a particular kind of minority and they enlist the minorities. So they basically say if you're a Hindu or a Christian or a Sikh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But what is very obvious is if you're a non-Muslim religious minority from these three countries. So that is the first stipulation. Obviously, the second stipulation is geographic stipulation that they have to come from these three countries. And the third stipulation is a temporal stipulation which is that they should have come into India before 2015. So in short, those non-Muslim minorities who have come from these three countries before 2015 would be given a faster route to naturalization. Another important aspect of uh, the 2019 Act is that these communities will not be treated as illegal migrants in the country. In other words, if they have come into India before 2015, on against the law, they had illegally come into the territory of India, then they would not be treated as illegal migrants. So what is the extension of that? The extension of that is that the category of illegal migrant would only apply to Muslims if they come from these three countries, right? This is, this is important to note. Similarly, the category of illegal migrant would continue to apply for those immigrant communities who have come illegally into India who are not from these three countries. So CAA 2019 does two things then. The first thing it does is it takes out certain communities from the category of illegal migrant. And the second thing it does is it provides faster route to naturalization or citizenship to those communities. So the first problem and a rather patent problem with the 2019 Act then is that it is discriminatory. Right? It is discriminatory because it chooses one identity in order to continue to make it an illegal migrant category, whereas purely on the basis of religion, it leaves out other categories or immunizes them from the category of illegal migration. Now, under Article 14, there is a requirement of what lawyers call reasonable classification, which basically means that similar groups should be treated similarly and different groups should be treated differently. Same people should be treated similarly and different people should be treated separately. And the test under Indian constitutional jurisprudence is something called the test of reasonable classification, which basically involves that there should be one, a clear distinction made between the different groups that parliament is making a law on. And secondly, there should be a connection between the purpose of the law and the distinction which the law makes. So, for example, in this case, in the 2019 CAA case, the classification is made between non-Muslim migrants from these three countries who have come before 2015 and all the others, right? And therefore, the test for Article 14 is, all right, you've made this distinction between these two categories of people. Is there a connection, a rational connection or a nexus between this classification and the purpose of the law? What is the purpose of this law? What parliament or well, what the government has argued in the Supreme Court is that the purpose of this law is to address the problem of persecution. So the obvious question to ask is, does this classification actually meet that purpose? And the biggest problem with the law is that it doesn't seem to meet that purpose. Why? Number one, because just because you're a Muslim community from these three countries does not mean you may not be facing persecution. For instance, if you're Shias, you're Hazaras from Afghanistan, you're Ahmadiyyas, right? So there are several Muslim communities that face religious discrimination uh, in, in these three countries. Secondly, if your purpose is to address persecution, why would you leave out Muslim or non-Muslim communities who fa face persecution from other countries? What about Sri Lankan Tamils who literally faced a civil war and was potentially a genocidal war in Sri Lanka? What about Tibetan Buddhists uh, in, in China, right? What about the Rohingya Muslims from Myanmar? Now, all these communities have arguably faced not just 
war crimes or potentially they face genocidal persecution in, in their respective countries. So an obvious question to ask is, if the purpose is to address or ameliorate persecution, why would you leave out these countries? Why would you then leave out these communities? Moreover, why would you stop at 2015? It's not the persecution suddenly stopped either in these three countries or other countries after 2015. Government will have to justify why 2015 was chosen as, as the date. So purely on a technical set of grounds, it seems that the requirements of Article 14 are not met. And it's not very obvious to me that if this test is applied with any amount of rigor by the Supreme Court, that the law would be considered constitutional. The second component would be constitutional identity. As I said, both fundamental rights and constitutional identity are relevant parameters or standards to judge the legality or constitutionality of any particular law. The second principle here is, as I said, is of secularism. That if citizenship law in this country should be non-sectarian, and that's what the government has said. The government has said, we are not making these laws for one religious community or the other. We are making these laws because we want to address persecution which is not a sectarian test. But if the first part of the test of Article 14 fails, that seems to suggest that the only basis of this law is sectarian, is non-secular, is based purely on a certain understanding of religious identity, which goes against the principle of secularism. So as to put sort of all these things together, if I would summarize, I would say that yes, parliament in India does have a wide discretion to decide who should be a citizen and who should not be. But still, fundamental rights and constitutional identity would be restrictions or limitations on that power. And when we look at CA 2019, because of its framing of purpose of persecution, it doesn't seem to either satisfy Article 14 and its requirement of reasonable classification, and also it seems to violate the constitutional identity principle of secularism because it appears to be a sectarian law. Professor, considering this, what you just told us, do you think that the act and the NRC itself is not secular, rather a personal attack to the illegal immigrants, especially the Muslims? What would be your take on this? So I think just to sort of clarify your question, I think it would be good not to use the phrase illegal migrants or illegal immigrants, etc. There are several reasons for it. I think purely at a humanitarian level, uh, to, to call certain human beings as being illegal or something is perhaps not the right language. Perhaps a good way to sort of describe people who are in this country without legal authorization at best could be unauthorized immigration immigrants or unauthorized aliens. Uh, so that I think that the language we use is really important, especially in today's uh, day and age. Um, the second uh, aspect of it, uh, which I suppose what you're asking is, what is the impact of these kind of laws, including NRC? And I haven't discussed NRC yet, but let's just stick to CA for the time being. What is the impact of CA on uh, unauthorized foreigners in the country? Um, that is a good question, but it is also quite speculative because the CA rules uh, and rules are required for uh, the implementation of CA. And they just were released uh, a few weeks ago, um, I think just about a month or so ago. So we don't know how exactly the government will implement CA. But if you look at the CA rules, there are certain requirements of documents which uh, potential beneficiaries have to provide. Many of these documents potential beneficiaries have to provide must belong to their country of origin. So for instance, if there is a certain person who wants to um, get the benefit of CA, uh, they will have to go to Bangladesh and arguably get these documents. So even when the government tells us that it wants to help certain um, foreigners in the country, specifically non-Muslim foreigners in the country, then it seems it's ought to expect them to then provide documents. The other sort of problem, and this is really important to know the context of CAA, is that um, India does not have a refugee policy. And India is under at least a baseline um baseline responsibility under international law to have some sort of refugee policy. Now, India has not signed and ratified the Refugee Convention. Um, 
Nevertheless, there are certain international human rights obligations, particularly a principle called non-refoulement. And the principle of non-refoulement is that if there is a foreigner in your territory, you sh the government should not send that person to a country where the person could be persecuted or even harmed or tortured or his basic rights uh, are violated. And India, irrespective of its ratification of the Refugee Convention, is under an obligation to respect basic human rights, uh, including non-refoulement of people who are uh, in, in our country. Um, and therefore, the biggest worry is that irrespective of CAA, India may be violating the rights of refugees who are in its territory. What the government has said is that CAA, by addressing the persecution of non-Muslim minorities in the country, is some sort of a refugee policy, right? But the first problem with that, as I as as would be clear from my previous response, is that a good refugee policy can't make sectarian distinctions. It can't say that if you're a Muslim or that if you're a Buddhist from China, we'll not treat you with a humanitarian refugee orientation, but we'll treat you only based on your name or your religion. So one, it doesn't seem to be a good refugee policy. In fact, it's not a refugee policy at all. The second thing is that even for those people it wants to give benefits to, uh, it seems to not be following a humanitarian process. So if you look at the CA rules, it does not have a dignified way in which a person would be able to prove that they have faced persecution in the past. If you look at many other countries that implement refugee policies, they have proper asylum systems, they have proper systems in which proper uh, rehabilitation is provided, there is amelioration of persecution. As if, if they are persecuted people, they would have faced tremendous trauma. And CAA 2019 it seems, claims to say that it is addressing persecution, but it doesn't have anything to say about trauma or rehabilitation or providing some job security, providing some welfare. There's absolutely nothing like that. So even though I'm speculating because CA has not been implemented at a certain level in which I can be confident about my answer, I know that this doesn't look like a refugee policy and it's highly unlikely it will be able to help even the people it is seeking to help. There's a separate dilemma that emerges when CA is mixed up with NRC, but I'm happy to sort of introduce the NRC if, unless you have more questions about CA. Um, so just to follow up, so is it fair to say that this discrimination goes back to maybe 1948 with the permit system that came into place? And like even the tiniest uh, differentiation that was made where the Hindu and Sikh uh, immigrants were called displaced persons, whereas the Muslims were called uh, evacuees. So can, is it fair to say that this the CA, the discrimination that the CA uh, has even today goes back uh, that far in time? Um, in many important ways, yes. In many other important ways, no. And I think both of these have to be emphasized. So it is absolutely true that this is not the first time in 2019 that the practices, institutional or political practices of uh, citizenship in India have reflected... Uh, a discriminatory orientation. Let me put it like that. Um, you're right that when uh, after partition, before and after the constitution was framed, and this is evident from looking at provisions like uh, Article 6 and 7 of the Indian constitution, what the Indian constitution and also sort of a range of other legal mechanisms around that time established was that if you are, practically speaking, a Hindu or Sikh coming into India after partition, obviously after having faced tremendous, horrifying partition violence uh, in uh, present Pakistan and uh, present Bangladesh, then you would be absorbed and accepted as Indian citizens. But there was a separate problem that arose with a different set of people. And this was a problem with those Muslims who also left India during partition violence. But once the partition violence somehow cooled down, they wanted to come back because they never intended to leave India permanently. Um, and many of these Indians and Indian Muslims got stuck in Pakistan and they wanted to come back. And the Indian government at that time created what eventually came to be known as the permit system. And the permit system required these Muslims to apply for permission to come back to India, which was really difficult to get. Uh, and once they got the permit, it was only then that they were able to come back and settle down. And then, of course, they had to sort of make sure that they were able to eventually get citizenship or their citizenship was affirmed. But a lot of historians have shown that 
the practices were so discriminatory that these Indian Muslims found it next to impossible to come back because they were not treated as Indian citizens at all, whereas their Hindu and Sikh counterparts were treated as legitimate, bona fide Indian citizens. So th there are those sort of historical problems that definitely existed in, in practice. But I think the important thing to acknowledge is that despite the horrifying violence of partition and also these kind of institutional practices, what was the principle that the Constituent Assembly accepted? If you look at part two of the Constitution, the Constituent Assembly accepted a secular and inclusive principle of granting citizenship. It did not say, even though there were many members of Constituent Assembly who said that Hindus and Sikhs should be considered to be uh, more Indian than, uh, for instance, Muslims, but the Constitution basically rejected that idea. And the idea of a secular non-sectarian citizenship was accepted. I think they also realized that if the country had to be non-sectarian, had to be secular, then the test for citizenship could not be a sectarian test. It is a misnomer, right? You Citizenship being perhaps the most significant legal status in, in a country could not be based on your religious identity in a country that would otherwise be considered to be secular, even though the word secular was obviously introduced much later. But the, the emerging, the sort of the animating ethic of the constitution was that it was a non-sectarian uh, polity and a non-sectarian constitution. So there was a tension between practice, politics versus constitution and principle. What the C, what CA 2019 does is it perhaps is the most dramatic formalization of sectarian politics and sectarian practices. And therefore, I feel it is the biggest threat to constitutional principle, that even though that principle was many times violated in practice, it was still a principle that became or had to be treated as a standard bearer. Uh, and that is a reason why CA 2019 should be taken very seriously by students of Indian constitution. Professor, before we move on to the next question, is it possible for you to elaborate a little bit on NRC and CA, the connection between them? Yes. So, so NRC or the National Register of Citizens um, is a mechanism through which the Indian state uh, wants to or claims to create a full enumeration of Indian citizens based on their documentary evidence. That would perhaps be the shortest definition I can provide of the NRC. And the NRC was introduced in 2003. And uh, the idea there was to have what was called a National Register of Indian Citizens, NRIC, for the whole country. And one can spend a lot of time discussing where that idea came from. But in a major way, that, that idea came from this deep anxiety or paranoia that there were several foreigners, particularly on India's eastern front uh, and bordering Bangladesh. And therefore, many of these uh, unauthorized uh, foreigners uh, are posing security or demographic threat in the country. A lot of it, I believe, uh, was not based on facts. Um, there, Even today, there is no evidence to suggest uh, how many or what is the scale of this problem, if there's a problem at all. And I'll come to Assam to, to sort of illustrate that. Um, now, the policy of the NRC was not implemented and still has not been imp implemented, but a version of that has been implemented in Assam. And that is what we know as NRC, National Register of Citizens, only in the case of Assam. And that was in earnest really started in 2012 by the Supreme Court when uh, uh, Chief Justice Gogoi and Justin Nariman's bench uh, accepted a petition filed by some Assamese civil society groups and said, all right, Assam is, has so many foreigners and so many unauthorized uh, foreigners and immigrants and therefore let's let's have this NRC policy um now let's let's come to what has happened in Assam because Assam is a peculiar case of if not peculiar but at least an extreme expression of the general problem of citizenship in India um now part of this problem emerges because of the civil war in Bangladesh leading up to 1971, when Bangladesh becomes a, a, an independent country. And Pakistan military's genocidal war in Bangladesh pushes not just Hindus, but many Muslim Bengalis also into India as refugees. And many of them come into West Bengal, many of them move to other parts of uh, India's Northeast. And that does raise uh, concerns among the local communities who have lived there for a while 
um, that maybe their majorities in these states would be threatened. So that is one dimension. But the second dimension in Assam is that so-called Bengali origin or Bengali speaking communities in Assam have lived there for centuries, at least since late 19th century. And many of them moved in during the British colonial era. And these communities are really poor, really marginalized. And um, they also uh, live really geographically also in the margins of, of Assam. And being highly stigmatized communities has also meant that many dominant Ahomea communities in Assam consider them not just marginalized, not just stigmatized, but also constantly refer to them as foreigners, even though they are not. So that really makes Assam a complicated place because the so-called foreigner problem in the state gets mixed up with the minority issue in, in the state as well. And therefore, particularly since 1980s, there has been a demand that foreigners must be identified and deported. And towards the towards late 1990s, this also became a demand for having an NRC in the state as one of the many ways in which foreigners could be identified and deported. Um, so when uh, the NRC started in 2012, many groups said, all right, this is a way to, to do exactly that work. But the problem, as I said, was that there was no numeric evidence or quantitative data to show who are these foreigners. How many are there? And there were all sorts of wild numbers that were thrown. There were some people who said there are 50 lakhs. Some people said there are two crores. And this really became, as you can imagine, a political battle. And it became increasingly uh, a highly reactionary, xenophobic form of politics that started playing out in Assam. So when the NRC eventually came out in a final form in 2019, it left out 2 million people, which is 20 lakh people. And as it turns out, the informal assessment is that among these 20 lakh people, there were perhaps around 7 lakh Muslims, but all the others were Hindus, which included not just Bengali origin Hindus or Bengali Hindus, but also people from Nepal, people from other parts of the country, and many indigenous tribal communities in Assam. And the reason for that is because the NRC demanded people to submit documents. And how many people would have documents? Uh, and even if they do have documents, how many of these documents would be error-free? And how many of these documents would not have contradictions? If you are poorer, if you're a woman, if you are an illiterate person, if you don't have property, or if you live in far-flung places, you're less likely to have well-ordered, clear, error-free documents. And those are exactly the people who eventually got left out from the NRC. I just want us to hold on to that idea because when we look at the debates around Assam, they're constantly these big numbers that are thrown out, that there are all these Muslim Bangladeshis who have entered and they are changing the nature of Assam. But when they even did these, uh, implemented these policies in NRC, there were perhaps six or seven lakh Muslims and most of the others were not even that in all likelihood, even those who were excluded would have uh, been excluded because uh, because of not having documents because they were poor or they were illiterate or they were women, right? Or they were in far-flung villages. Now, all these people have the right to appeal to foreigners' tribunals, which is another story. These are terrible inst institutions that are not run by the rule of law at all. But irrespective, they have a right to appeal against the exclusion. So that that is really the story of the NRC, which is that these dramatic documentary policies are introduced in places like India or even in the poorest parts of the country. And Assam is not a rich state where people are forced to provide documents in order to prove their citizenship and they're just bound to be excluded. And even those numbers, when they show up, they don't seem to justify this paranoia or anxiety around so many foreigners in, in, in the state. Now to your original question about how does this link up to CAA? Principally, it shouldn't. Because NRC is a separate policy. It was there in 2003. And CAA is something that was introduced in 2019, right? And they don't necessarily legally need to work together. Where does the problem lie? One, the problem lies in political rhetoric. So if the worst case scenario would be that NRC is implemented, people are left out, and those who are non-Muslims then, or, or th those people who would fit the criteria of CAA would then be given citizenship uh, under the law, and all the others would formally be classified as foreigners. That, that is obviously a doomsday scenario, but unfortunately that doomsday scenario is something that the government leaders told us and we didn't really cook that up. So when we are thinking about the two laws working together, it becomes a really worrying issue because of the lessons in Assam.
who are the people who are left out. And what we realize is that the people who are left out invariably are the most marginalized people and would not be only one religious community or the other. They would be across the board. And then to make them, now notice what, what is going to happen. If CAA will be implemented, these communities who are left out will be asked, you accept first that you're a foreigner because that's what CA says, right? CA says that if you are an unauthorized immigrant in the country, you're not an Indian and you're from these three countries and you've suffered from persecution and you're able to get some documents to prove that and you've come here before 2015, then we'll give you citizenship. So basically what implementing CA would mean is that all these people who had actually applied to NRC saying what? That they are Indian citizens, right? That's why they were submitting documents. Now they've been rejected. Suppose you're a Hindu, you're being rejected after claiming you're an Indian citizen. Now the government will come and tell you, now you say you're actually a Bangladeshi, somehow get some way to prove that, and now we'll give you citizenship. And that seems to me to be wrong for both sets of people. It seems to be wrong for Muslim immigrants or Muslim communities who have been left out and not being accepted because of their religious identity. It also seems to be a horrifyingly undignified way of treating Hindu or non-Muslim uh, immigrant immigrant communities or individuals or citizens who have lived in this country for a long time by forcing them to claim that they are not Indians and they are foreigners. So that seems to be how these two laws will eventually work together. But I have to I have to be quite imaginative because it has not happened yet. Um, so to, try to kind of draw up a conclusion and to moving on to the last question. So we've already established uh, how both the NRC and CAA undermine the core principles of, democ of a democratic society. And we've also established how these policies impact the delicate balance between uh, national security and the rule of law, constitutionalism in India. Uh, but could you comment on what the long-term effects of both these laws could be? Yeah, again, so it's difficult to know simply because these policies have not been implemented. It's quite difficult to know um, the scale at which these laws would be implemented. So, for instance, uh, the demand for or the government's proposal of implementing an all-level NRC seems to have been pushed on the side and we don't know whether it will be. Uh, similarly, even though there are some reports that are coming in that people, some people at least, particularly on the Western border, on Pakistan side, people in Gujarat or in Rajasthan who have come from Pakistan, to Pakistani Hindu immigrants, have been given citizenship under CAA. It's not very clear what the scale of that implementation would be. But if these laws are implemented, and particularly NRC is implemented uh, across the country at a large scale, then I think it will fundamentally disrupt uh, the very notion of Indian citizenship. And the reason for that is that even as a, as a constitutional scholar, I think Indian citizens do have a constitutional right in the form of a legitimate expectation that their citizenship status will not be arbitrarily questioned or targeted. Um, it seems to me that that is a fundamental feature of right to life and right to equality and non-arbitrariness in, in India that an Indian national to the very least should expect that the Indian government is not suddenly going to come up and create these demanding procedures uh, where their citizenship status can be, can be questioned that easily. And once we don't grant that, and that expectation is violated, then uh, anybody's citizenship can be questioned. Then I don't think Indian citizenship as a status has any meaning left anymore. The second disturbing consequence could be because of the sectarian background or political context in which these laws are being made, it would just constantly internalize and embed religious distinctions in our democratic life. Because it will be a constant reminder that the reason we are Indian citizens or we are not Indian citizens or that our Indian citizenship is being questioned or made uncertain if nothing else, is only on the ground of religious identity. And whether that is done formally or not, that seems to just normalize and embed uh, religious sectarian understanding of Indian political life and democratic life, which I think will, in, in the long run, I think erode the democratic character of, of India. Uh, both erode that as well as erode any semblance of stability or meaning of Indian citizenship status itself. 
So that's quite a grim assessment of what these laws could could entail. Uh, Professor, while the discourse around CA and NRC yeah. is not one that could be concluded, we actually would like to conclude this and thank you for your time, your expertise, insights on this topic to provide us and also the listeners with an understanding from a new perspective. It's actually been really uh, quite insightful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure.